Last time on Void Star Lab, I waged a one-man crusade against code circuitry and cantankerous corporate curmudgeons as I clambered to complete a cutting-edge cybernetic computer before the contemporary configuration catastrophically crapped its chaps. In the end, victory was ours in the form of the stupidest circuit board I have ever made. A small smidgen of scanning, a piddling pinch of printing, and a tiny titch of tape to hold it together, and I was reading bad puns off a jank-ass face computer once more. There was just one little problem. It sucks! Ladies, gentlemen, and cyborgs, welcome back to Void Star Lab, where it's not the project that finishes, but your mind. A few weeks ago, I vanquished an eight-month bug and slammed the door on my most important project, the Optagon wearable computer. I hastily slapped together a frame, I added in the modded optics, and proceeded to deliver the finest screenwriting since the levitating pair scene from Attack of the Clones. The content was live, the sponsor was contractually obligated to be happy, and I finally got to take my first week off in over 18 straight months of YouTubing. America! To toast my facial triumph, I went to a bar for the first and only time in nearly two years. I immediately got sick, and I spent my only break all year, and probably all of next year too, running a 104 fever and pooping battery acid. I know we all want to pretend the pandemic is over and go on with our lives, but you know what? You've already watched enough of this video for YouTube to register your view, so I don't give a f about you. Call up the boys, throw major rage and see if the ICU nurse will put your beds together so you can hear your best buddies gurgle out their dying words. This episode is sponsored by Anycubic, who should really start watching the videos before they approve them. They sent me yet another resin printer, the Photon M3 Premium, which makes a total of six resin and eight FDM printers cluttering this dinky ass lab. But the M3 Premium is not just an MSLA printer. This is the MSLA printer, the glorious high watermark of resin engineering, a machine so intense, I'm not even doing the portmanteau. Yeah. Oh my god, the dog's figured out how to open the door. Oh, Millie, Mill, Mill, hi, hi, Mill. <laughs> oh, for fuck's sake. They figured out how to use doorknobs. We're doomed. We're all doomed. Bzzz. This is the Amerilabs Town, one of the most brutal resin benchmarks. The M3 Premium ate it for lunch. I'm telling you, tab over and just look at these tiny little windows. Like, the detail is unreal. The over-engineering doesn't stop at the Z-axis. The M3 Premium has two linear bearings and a zero backlash double ball screw for microscopic layer lines in even the stickiest stuff juice. They even built a pair of activated charcoal air filters right into the chamber so it even smells premium. But beneath those slick Art Deco lines lies the M3 Premium's crown jewel, Anycubic's brand new and truly gratuitous Light Turbo 2.0. This system exposes the entire layer with a single LED the size of a walnut. A chip on board colossus so grossly incandescent it takes two gaming PC heat sinks to cool it off. Most MSLA printers cure resin with a grid of LEDs. These create hot spots and fire light at weird angles which sneaks ultraviolet into areas that are supposed to stay liquid. But the light turbo bounces a single point of light off a collimating mirror, delivering nearly parallel rays of ultra-uniform ultraviolet that barely spread as they enter the resin. The M3 Premium puts more light into your model and leaks less to munge the details. This is crucial for today's project because we are building a rare style of wearable display that as far as I know has never before been open sourced. If you're interested in the printer or if you want to take advantage of Anycubic's resin and filament sale, please use the link in the description to support the channel and support the people who support the channel. But wait, you say, didn't you finish the headset last time, you dashing cybernetic raconteur? Well, I sure thought I did, but when the Rona wasn't making me suffer enough, I read your comments. This one said the first version looked better. Uh, that's fair, you'll see why I couldn't use that design in a second. This one asked why I live in squalor, and the answer is I am a terrified child pretending to be an adult. But over 50 of you helpfully pointed out that the heads-up display I slaved over for eight desperate months was not perfectly level. It's our community duty to do what we can to stop it here and now. One of you even told me to, and I quote, Throw it all out and start over, semicolon close parentheses. You know what I think of your opinion, blurry mosaic, Steen? I think it's correct. 
That's ridiculous. Ish. Don't want you people to think you're smarter than me. See, in my first couple shots with the new heads-up display, it was indeed blatantly askew. The arm snapped off as we were setting up the shoot, so I scrounged up a previous revision and it, like, wasn't shaped right. Brooke quickly noticed how lopsided it looked on camera, she yelled cut, and she waited while I added a bungee cord to mash it back onto my punum. A few seconds of those early takes did make it into the final cut, but for most of the video, the Optagon 2 was nearly level. But the commenters weren't complete morons. Even though the frame was mostly straight, I am not. Not in the mandatory in Florida schools kind of straight. No, I was being literal. I have scoliosis, so my left shoulder is higher than my right shoulder. I try to frame these talking headshots to draw attention away from it, but once I had a horizon line across my face, something looked off kilter. Folks don't expect crooked people, which is odd considering every town has a police department, but they do expect crooked glasses. So, you know, the Optagon caught the flack. You could say that my frame was framed. Yeah, see? I bought some cheap titanium glasses to try and slim down the silhouette, you know, make a similar setup to the previous Optagon, but the BT-40's vision module uh, just has to sit too far from my face. Also, minor tangent, these so-called blue light blocking glasses are five trillion percent horse <laughs> If these lenses actually blocked blue light, they would be yellow because blue light wouldn't make it through because it got blocked by the glasses. That's why resin printers have amber lids. Ultraviolet light, which has a wavelength right next to blue, has a harder time passing through it. I would go into why the laser cutter also has an amber shield, but this script has gone so far into the weeds it's legal in Colorado. So the goal remains to print our own frames, but the optimal strategy to counteract gravity, the thing we'll be printing, comes from the very beginning of my career. I'm revisiting uh, arguably my first project, the project that kickstarted my whole maker odyssey, the Optagon. No, not the last one. The BT-200 Optagon is actually the seventh Optagon. <laughs> Us sacks with the cages love rebooting franchises. My first stab at wearing a computer was a Vuzix Eyewear AV230 cut in half and mounted to a coat hanger. I chose the behind the neck form factor, pretty ambitious setup for a project whose bill of materials was coat hanger. A behind-the-neck headset has a pair of ear hooks clamped down by a tension band around the non-face side of your dome. You often see this in sports headphones because the neck band doesn't block a hat or a helmet. It's a useful feature when you get steamrolled by a jacked-up F450 because you're blasting Chumbawamba instead of maintaining situational awareness. The problem with a behind-the-neck head-mounted display is stability. You have these heavy optics on a seesaw and your ears are the fulcrum, so they tend to flop, and because the optics are only supported on one end, the picture bounces and wobbles as you walk. Back in the day, I could barely solder the wires for this project, let alone solve all these challenges, and I also couldn't get the electronics off the coat hanger, so that little micro display, like my first electronics project itself, flopped. I couldn't find that original Optagon, but I did find something better for plagiar inspiration. This is the Goulton C200S, one of the few commercial behind-the-neck head-mounted displays, and a very special boy. Note the off-the-shelf flashlight, the stupid clip, the camera placed as far as possible from the display, making augmented reality even more impossible, and the $1,500 price tag on AliExpress. But look at that headband. Those oversized sideburns increase the surface area to add more friction to brace against my face. The neck pad adds a third point of contact to stabilize the display. The jointed arm is really clever. That means you don't have to get the headband level to get the display level. Only the eyepiece is visible. All in all, this is a perfect setup for my wearable teleprompting. My head hides the tilt that made you tilt, and there's no extra plastic between you and my eyebrows. The wobbling is irrelevant because I'm never leaving the workshop again. I already had a 3D scan of my head for some reason, so it was super easy to trace a basic headband, then rip-propriate the sideburns and neck pad from the Goulton headset. 
The BT-40 has a very narrow eye box, so to see the whole picture, the prism has to be fairly close to the eye and dead center. So instead of bolting the optics straight to the frame or adding a simple arm, I built out a fully adjustable mounting system with multiple points of articulation. First is the slider plate. This adjusts the distance between prism and eye. The closer the prism, the more wiggle room I have while still seeing all four corners of the picture. But if I put it too close, it'll brush against my eyelashes, which is very uncomfortable. The slider mounts to a hinge and a pivot plate to adjust pan and tilt respectively. These axes set where in my field of view the display appears. I can place it above my sight line like a Google Glass, below it like a dashboard, or directly in front like a nerd. Finally, the second most important joint after the one I'm going to blaze uh, right now, because it's currently 4.20 in the morning. A ball and socket. This lets me swivel the display on all three axes, which levels out that irksome tilt and aims the display right into my people. Up to four grub screws bite into the ball to lock it in place. Ouch! The ball is where we actually mount the display. I decided to keep the original metal enclosure since the BT-40's tiny OLED counts on having it to use as a heatsink. This design also lets you attach any optics you want, not just a Moverio. The BT-40 is a pricey piece of tech, and let's just say Epson did not exactly earn my loyalty in the last episode. This little channel lets me route the cable over my ear and down my back, which absorbs some of the strain and effectively lightens the load. Let's shoot the elephant in the room. Goulton distributed the circuitry between both temples to balance the weight of the display. I am going to get an Avogadro's number of helpful comments suggesting I do the same, but no. You know why? Because I don't want to. The cable between the vision module and the interface board is only 400 millimeters long, and that's too short to wrap around my head. I see you typing away, you a ninny hammer you taught you're saying i should just make an extension cable listen you fucking punk i soldered like a dozen of these tiny ass mezzanine connectors last episode and if i have to reflow one more 0.2 millimeter pin under a microscope i will kick this 3d printer into the fourth dimension but please leave the comment anyways the algorithm needs them to feed me views and i need your views to afford toilet paper two ply or three ply let me know down below one ply people you and your calloused cornholes are not welcome here a big soft neck pad spreads the weight across my nape, dampening impacts with the squishiest TPU I got, and you know I got all of them. I ran off iteration after iteration, honing in on the perfect cocktail of ear proximity grippiness, neck-on headband cushiness, and literal flexibility. This produced a lot of trash, even by my standards, but when it comes to wearables, you just gotta embrace the waste. It's just not possible to judge a wearable on paper. Only building and wearing the design is going to check its compatibility with the way squishy flesh moves in real life. I exported the STLs, uploaded everything for you to download, in the description, nudge, nudge, wink, wink, and queued up the final draft. I literally touched on this in the last episode, but when it comes to print on skin contact, the sauce beats the spaghetti. A resin print's extreme resolution and satiny surface create a smooth, flowing curve that comfortably nestles into nubile human anatomy. Ooh. I chose to use the Soraya Blue from the Nerf episode, but I added a secret ingredient, Mayer Makes Engineering Resin. This is like a small batch artisanal resin uh, made by a fellow YouTuber and it is literally tough as nails, like you can print a nail and hammer it. I happen to have a rather large high performance resin printer on hand, what are the odds, but you can run this thing off in your $100 Micro Center bed slinger just fine. Just use ABS or something that you can sand and print the thinnest layers possible for the least chafing layer lines. Why well, use fax when I can wave my hands around? I still use filament for the mounting arm because dimensionally accurate resin prints are really hard to pull off reliably, especially when they have really thin cross sections, uh, especially when they have undercuts like the ball and socket, especially when you need threaded inserts, and especially when you also want the models to print well out of filament. Just one last bit of assembly required, ripping off the imbalanced frame and whipping it into the garbage. Wait, forgot to salvage the nose piece. One sec, thanks for waiting. Yeet. I cracked open the eyepiece, drilled a hole, and screwed it into the ball joint, which I have already popped into the socket arm. 
This tilts on the swivel joint, which slides in the slider plate, which mounts to the resin headset. All in all, granting me every degree of articulation your self-diagnosed OCD could possibly desire. I just realized that I solved the problem of my display being tilted by adding like six more axes it can tilt on. Overkill? No, actually. I'm building this so that you can build this, and there is incredible variation in cranial shape, eye separation, and according to these smart looking white guys, value to society. Let me know if you build your own, and if you do, let me know how it fits. I don't know anything about heads. I'm not a head of state. I don't run a head shop. I guess I'm kind of the head of the family. I'm, I'm a head on the things leaderboard. And here we go. Behold Optagon 2 behind the neck boogaloo. To fit it, I tighten the screws most of the way, put it on, maneuver the optics into position, and do some gentle head banging to force everything to settle. Once I found a good stable position, I just tighten all the screws and it's solid as a rock. Until it wasn't. The longer I wore the headset, the less comfortable it felt. The display was drooping, the temples were tilting, the arms were slipping over my ears. Things just got worse and worse till it just straight up refused to stay on my head. I had made a mistake straight out of Physics 101. Soraya Blue and Maker Makes Engineering Resin are formulated for toughness. They resist impacts that would instantly shatter a weaker polymer. These are seriously tough, but they're not strong. And when it comes to physics, tough and strong are not synonyms. Toughness is resistance to fracturing. And you know, if I bopped this thing with a hammer, it shrugs it off. But strength is resistance to changing shape. And this, my friends, is downright flaccid. As I wore the system, my head was prying and holding the band open, applying constant tension, compression, and torsion. These resins are tough because they absorb mechanical energy like a spring, storing it by changing their shape. Once the force, i.e. my noodle, is removed, the resin slowly releases the stored energy and relaxes back to its printed shape. That's why I never spotted this earlier. I wasn't wearing it long enough and the resin hid the evidence. This is called elastic deformation and usually it's a good thing. I mean, after all, a little temporary bending beats permanent plastic deformation or worse, sudden shattering. But this project calls for strength, not toughness. After only a few minutes, the headband was so slack it was slipping right over my ears. I just want to be clear, this isn't a design flaw in the Optagon, the resin, or the printer. I just picked the wrong material. The solution is to simply reprint the frame out of a strong material, like polycarbonate or carbon fiber nylon. You home gamers can even use just regular ass PLA, which is one of the stiffest, strongest plastics around, although its extremely low toughness is too fragile for my needs. In the meantime, I reinforce the headband with a stronger material. A length of bent coat hanger. Time is a flat circle. Still, I am super proud of this design because it doesn't just look great on camera, it looks like a heads-up display. That's why I picked a form factor for my first project. I don't think heads-up displays should be disguised as glasses. They should look like what they are. Gibson hacking, mech suit piloting, power level measuring ass wearable technology. Back then, my newbie ass couldn't keep up with my ideas, but over a decade later, I finally gained the experience, finesse, and sick ass workshop to finish the wearable of my dream. I'm getting mushy over here. Although, this isn't actually the end of this project. Remember, the BT-40 is just a display, so I moved on to building the belt-mounted Optagon 2 Brain Box. This thing has the high-powered Cottus Edge V from two episodes ago, a hot swappable camcorder battery, and uh, I just had the weirdest sense of deja vu. Anyways, that's all the time we got, and if you want to see more projects, there are hot subscribe buttons in your area looking to smash. Thanks to Anycubic for setting me up with this phenomenal M3 Premium. Dive into the description to learn more and also score some sweet discounts on resin and filament. While you're there, make sure you download the new and improved Optagon files. They say if you open your mind too far, your brain will fall out, and the proof is in the patrons. Folks like lab scientists Axel Walsleben, Jack Matheson, and Stephen Bourne are the grease that makes Void Star Lab's squeakiest wheels not squeak. Our lovely collaborators include Command, Creality Online Store, What the Chuck, Caster, The Catboy, Schleppy, The Schwagster, The Suits Ruined Our Fun, Oh, I forgot to put and in there. I've hidden their names somewhere in this episode, and if you manage to find them, this preemptive golf clap is for you.
The marginally offensive lab assists in arms race rages on, fueled by creative monikers like kink shaming walrus, Steven six foot six figure six pack Schulte, protagonist, Burn Duck Three, Kevin DeGraff, Cold Dawn, Kyle Fisher, Burn It, Eddie, Ashley Coleman, Ghost of Brad Stormer, Call Sign Carrot, Boulder Creek Yard, James, Storm B Design, Verka, Nathan Johnson, a very fine dumpster fire, Amma the Great, Scroto Sagans, Bob Dobbington, Zanforian, Michael Roche, Michael, Ethan Gomes, Onyx Plague, Zosh, Powerful CCH, The Cut Fish, Trump Did Nothing Wrong, Clifton Henning, Little Bobby Tables, Max, Max Luck Says That'll Teach You Epson, Bum Tickly 69, Isakai Elf, Mahir Chan Desina, Rusty Flute, Dempsers 603, Cullen J. Webb, Stephen Duval, Good Suck, The Antifa, Thomas B. Myers, Azunda, Wielder of Iron Heater of Shrink, Bill Schooler, Marxism, Brad Cox, Oral Netta, Acorn, Birds Aren't Real, Wake Up Sheeple, Bab Stabbington, Lydia K, Granville Schmidt, Roger Pinkham of the Great Star Theater, Ryan Gooler, Danny Devoid of Life, Quantumly Tangled, One Handful of Beans, uh, Quantum Foam, SXP, Vicarious Nerdgasms, My Dog is a Bear, The Benevolent Misanthrope, Iron Rain, Danny McGee, Talon Democratic Socialist, and Pretty Righteous Dude, Dash Zack, Cameron Swords, Cats, CT Matt, Good Lady Nat, Queen of Lemons, Victor of the Great Citrus Wars, Booba Kiss, Post Poop Zoomies, Sunburnt Cat, Period Clots, Dimitri Lair, Joshua Gdovin, Trans Rights, and Fleetle Deedle, Leetle Deedle, Fleetle I91. I suspect they meant two less than ten times ten plus one or LXXXI and had an abacus malfunction. Who hasn't? May you and your face stay on the level, and I will see you in the future.